Right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to George House Trust today. This is the third of our HIV live talks, and we're live from Manchester at the wonderful George House Trust. It's good to be back. Um, today, we're talking about uh, what do we know about HIV and ageing, and why are, we, why are we talking about this? Well, um, obviously, around the, country, around the world now, we're seeing an increase in the number of people living with HIV aged 50 and over. And uh, thanks to antiviral, antiretroviral medication, uh, people are obviously living longer, and we're now told that we can expect um, the same life expectancy as those who are not living with HIV. Um, consequently, the they're saying that the over 50s are now the fastest growing group of people living with HIV, certainly in the UK. And um, the King's Fund predicted that by 2028, 54% of people living with HIV in the UK will be aged 50 and over. Um, so we're seeing the first generation of people growing older with HIV, and this is a good thing, and it's to be celebrated, and there's been lots of great work that's gone on so far, but there's lots of things that we don't still really know much about or we're unsure of because this is the first generation of people in with HIV so they're in a way they're the guinea pigs of medication and experience um, and so um, there's lots still to learn about living with HIV as we grow older um, and with this unknowns so with these number of unknowns there's lots of uncertainty that comes around that and that can be unsettling and can create a number of new challenges for people as they age with HIV. So today we're going to be trying to find out what we actually do know and what we can be sure about and what we're not quite so sure about still. Um, and we're going to hear about people's own living um, life experience of living with HIV as they grow older. So we have three speakers today who will open our discussion about uh, living with HIV. We've got uh, Dr. Claire Van Helsummer, who's the consultant in HIV medicine from the North Manchester General Hospital. And she's going to talk to us about understanding around HIV and ageing, um, what we're seeing in the ageing cohort, and share some thoughts about how we might look after ourselves and try to make ourselves um, age better if we can, what things we can think about to help us on that journey. Unfortunately, our second speaker, Sophie Strachan, uh, was unable to make it at the last minute. So I'm going to be sharing with you some um, slides around um, a more so psychosocial experience of growing older with HIV, um, largely taken from the findings of the Uncharted Territory report from Terence Higgins Trust back in 2017. And then finally, we've got Morris Greenham, who's a fabulous man, who's uh, our LGBT and HIV activist, and he's going to share with us his experience of ageing with HIV and what he's been up to. So there will be a chance to answer questions at the end, um, but please wait for the microphone to be handed to you before asking your question, just so that we can get sure, make sure that people online can hear the questions that are being asked in the room. So I'd like to welcome Claire to the stage and uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, hello, and thanks for coming. Um, Clive's asked me to talk a little bit about where we are with our knowledge of, in ageing with HIV and what we can do to improve longevity, improve health, and make sure that we have good quality life going forward. He's also told me that this thing works. There we go, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that way. So that's me, Claire Van Halsemer. I work at North Manchester General Hospital. Okay, so you know, this that's on the first slide and I start most of my talks with this now talks for colleagues at the hospital who I'm asking to test for HIV talks for the medical department the emergency department with this news on the left hand side I've even got a pointer this is a Swiss group um, a Swiss research study but it's the same here that on treatment especially if diagnosed promptly people with HIV have the same life expectancy of pe as people who do not have HIV. So that's great news and it really helps to be able to give that message, particularly to people who've just had their diagnosis. The other piece of fantastic news, I would say, that we can't repeat often enough, is that we know that on antiretroviral therapy with an undetectable viral load, so with treatment that's working, we cannot pass HIV on to other people. Now this has taken a while to 
to come. We sort of knew this for a while, but now we can finally say we've got enough evidence to say that for sure. And in medicine, we don't say anything for sure very often. We're taught to never say never and never say always. But in this case, we can say there really hasn't, it never happened. No one with an undetectable viral load has ever passed HIV to their sexual partner. So that's great. Okay. So it's a crowded field, people over 50 with HIV, and you're in good company. This graph is from Public Health England. This number here is how many people, and these are the years, and the colours are the age bands, and these are people who come to clinic for HIV, people accessing HIV care in the UK. So we're interested in the red band here, 50 to 64, and the grey band there over 65. And can you see the increased numbers of people coming to clinic? So in my clinic, I see people from 18 to, I, I think I've got 83 or 84. That's my, the range. It's really the whole lifespan, along with all the other sort of life and health issues that go along that lifespan. And so HIV physicians got to be really broad in that and work with other specialties and work with GPs to look after people well. So um, these bands will only get broader as we go forwards. Okay. Um, so in terms of new, di this, the last slide was people accessing HIV care. This is about new diagnoses and Morris and I were just chatting about how many new diagnoses in older people we're seeing and in people who, whose doctors may not immediately think to do an HIV test and we were talking about the importance of routine testing. So number of diagnoses by exposure group going down particularly in gay and bisexual men but older people in 2019 13% of new diagnoses in people over 50 and more recently 21% of new diagnoses per year in the over 50s. So we mustn't exclude those people from all the testing um, efforts that we're making. Okay. So this is about living a long time. We've said that with HIV we can have a normal life expectancy and a lot of the studies sort of look at people with HIV and people who don't have HIV but need to control for a lot of other factors, particularly smoking and lifestyle things, other things that can be with the matter with us. These are the Danes. In group zero up there, that's the HIV negative and positive, I suppose, population comparisons, that's general population. If the line's high up like this, it means nobody's died, and as people die, the, li the line falls off. Okay. Group one up there is people with HIV, up there with, the normal, with the, 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 the normal life expectancy that we'd expect in the background population. Group two, people with a very low CD4 or advanced HIV. We know that there's a higher risk of death if we're diagnosed late um, and that to mitigate that, we need to make sure that we get to people earlier. The next group, group three, people with something else the matter. Now, of course, the more things we've got the matter with us, the more challenging that is in terms of living a long time. Group four, the ones who really, where the life expectancy really does tail off, it's alcohol and drug use. So if it's just HIV, there's no problem. It's the other things that might come along with that that are the problems. And of course, all those things exist in people without HIV as well, but the studies need to pick that out. So um, it's, it's the other things. So we can look after ourselves. So that's, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> We're living longer. That means that there are more older people living with HIV because people are getting older. As we get older, we're more prone to additional health problems. We start counting up additional things that are wrong, additional things that we might need to take medicines for, blood pressure and so on. So there's been a lot of talk about whether those things happen more frequently or are worse in people with HIV. I've got a graph. I'll talk you through it. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> I've tried to make it slightly simpler by getting rid of some technical terms here. All right. So the blue bars are people who have had HIV for more than 20 years. Okay. The green bars are people who have, had, have had, who have had HIV for less than 11 years, and the yellow bars are people who are HIV negative. All right. So blue, HIV for a long time. Green, HIV for a little less time. Yellow, no HIV. And this is just how many of those people have heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, kidney problems, or have two or more additional problems as well as HIV. And you can see that it's more in people who have HIV for more than 20 years, slightly reduced in people with HIV for less time, um, and slightly reduced again in people without HIV. Okay. And there's something about having HIV for a long time that I think we're yet to sort out. We've got, so HIV aged and HIV aging. People who've had HIV for a long time, they're the ones at the top 
and the as with the line goes up that tells us more likely to have more things wrong with us at once so probability of multimorbidity they call it multimorbidity or comorbidities lots of different problems um, to manage so people who've had hiv for a long time more likely people who have had hiv for a shorter time not so many things are wrong even if they're the same age and those without HIV, not so many things wrong. I wonder if that's about just the time we're at, where people who've had HIV for a long time at the moment haven't always been on therapy. Whereas as we go forward, people who are diagnosed now and have HIV for 30, 40 years will always have been on therapy. And I think to me, there's something about having had untreated HIV because that was the guidelines at the time, or we didn't have tolerable treatment. You know, we waited, didn't we, until CD4s were 200 or 350, whereas now we treat straight away. And to me, I think there's something there, a, a period of time spent with untreated HIV, but that's not something that a study has proven as yet to my knowledge. So why is it? Does HIV age us? They call that physiological aging. Is it related to inflammation? There's something there, particularly with untreated HIV, virus swimming around the blood. We know that's bad for us and it causes inflammation. With an undetectable viral load, maybe not so much, but maybe there is just a little bit of inflammation going on. Is it not quite normal immune system? So even with a good CD4, especially if we've had a period of time off treatment, antibody damage and so on, or is there worsening of other conditions? There's a term that people called inflammaging, so inflammation causing possible premature features of ageing. Okay. Or is it lifestyle thing? Is there some link between having HIV and lifestyle issues that might be bad for our health? Or is there something else? Okay. So here are some scientists, and they've made us a diagram of how it all works. <laughs> And so I was looking that, at that and I was thinking, how can, we, how can we pick that apart? So here are some, some people who aren't scientists. And, and I think the things that we can talk about sensibly and the things that we can understand is maybe less this stuff about adipocytes and so on, but lifestyle factors and which antiretroviral therapy we use. I think those are the things that we've got some control over, aren't they, that we can do something about. And some of it is just common sense. So here are our healthcare team. You might know some of them. <laughs> and here's our person in the centre who has HIV and needs their care. Okay. Have you heard of the fourth 90 or have you heard of the first three 90s? Okay. So this is a UNA, this is an international global target to reach people with HIV and make sure that everybody's on their treatment, everybody's undetectable and everybody's getting the best care possible and the best long lifetime and you know, outcomes from HIV. Everybody's living a long life. So the first 90 is that we must diagnose at least 90% of people. We've done that in the UK, we've done that in Manchester and we need to work towards 100% very promptly. The second 90 is that of those diagnosed, 90% should be on treatment. Again, we've done that in the UK, we've done it in Manchester. The third 90 of those, 90% should have an undetectable viral load. And we need to be really working towards 95, 95, 95, and then 100, of course, for all of them. Now, this fourth 90, sorry, wasn't there in the beginning, but somebody suggested surely we should also be aiming for good quality of life. So they popped it on the end of the fourth 90 until it was suggested that maybe even those who weren't diagnosed or weren't undetectable also ought to have a good quality of life, that it shouldn't be stuck on the end, but should encompass the whole spectrum of people with HIV, from those who haven't been diagnosed yet to those who are struggling with treatment or aren't quite undetectable. So everybody, okay. So these are what I think sort of mostly medically speaking are some of the key issues that people are facing. Clive used the term guinea pigs. I like pioneers <laughs> in terms of heading into older age with HIV. It's new. There's some great research going on and we're, you know, and some people are participating in that very generously. But guinea pigs, not so much. Pioneers showing us how it's done um, heading into old age with HIV. So these are some of the concerns and, some, and these are some of the things that we should be looking for in clinic and that you can be discussing with your HIV clinician, your HIV nurse, your GP. Okay. Here's the first one, cardiovascular risk. We do scores, we talk about cholesterol. And so I guess the key thing is to get informed. What are your numbers? What are we aiming for? And what are the benefits of having numbers that your doctor wants? You know, or are they just looking for something to do because your HIV is fine. This is what I say to people who come and see me, that your HIV is not going to get you, so let's have a look at what might. 
So cardiovascular disease, know your cholesterol number. Is it less than five? If it is, you're probably fine. If it isn't, have a chat with your doctor. Know your blood pressure. Is it about that or is that top number heading off towards 200? In which case there are things to be done about it. Don't smoke, that's not, the first, that's not the last time I'm going to say that. Don't smoke. None of us can smoke, but there does seem to be a link between <coughs> HIV and lung cancer and HIV and cardiovascular disease, such that the risk is a little higher and it's really hard to stop, but there's a lot of support to stop. Get active, even moderately. So weight-bearing exercise for bones, it's all good for our blood pressure and it brings some of the weight off. Drop the extra weight. And then ask about a Bacavir. Some people will be taking a Bacavir as part of combinations like Triamec, Kyvexa, and so if you're taking a Bacavir, just be aware of the link between a Bacavir and cardiovascular disease, your doctor will know. And when cardiovascular risk reaches a certain point, it's time to discuss whether that's still the best treatment for you. Okay. And if you need a statin, which is a cholesterol drug, ask about drug interactions. Okay. Remember that chart that I showed you at the beginning, this paper from Switzerland about life expectancy and how life expectancy should be the same as anyone else. They do comment that we could do even better if everybody stopped smoking. <laughs> so so um, that's really key, really important. Okay, cancers are a key thing. When some of the people I've been looking after have died, it's been with cancer, um, certainly not HIV. So there are screening programmes. Some kick in at 55 or 65, bowel cancer screening, breast screening, attend those. Send back the postal kit for the bowel cancer screening. Go for your mammograms if you're a woman. Look out for prostate cancer symptoms if, you, if you're a man. And see your GP in between times. Don't say, well, I've got my HIV appointment in six months. I'll mention this symptom then. Go and see your GP and check in about it. And, uh, oh, don't smoke. <laughs> so don't ignore the signs. If you're a woman, check your breasts. Um, look out for symptoms of those things. Liver disease is another key thing. Um, so know your hepatitis B and C status. Your doctor will know. It'll probably be in your clinic summary. So do you get copies of your clinic summaries? Have a look. Make sure that hepatitis B and C have been looked at. If you've got hepatitis C, the treatment is fantastic now and it's come on leaps and bounds such that nobody should have active hepatitis C for very long at all because the treatment is so good. Ask about fatty liver and know what your alcohol units are. Just have a little count up over a week and make sure that the alcohol that you're drinking isn't above recommended, which is 14 units a week for everybody. Okay. Kidney things. We do a lot of um, checking urine samples, don't we? Checking bloods. Blood pressure can affect kidneys. Diabetes can affect kidneys. I've got a group of patients with HIV that's really well controlled and diabetes that really isn't. Um, and of course, for those people, that's the main threat to their long, good quality life. So tenofovir has, in a, in a minority of people, causes some kidney dysfunction. If you're on tenofovir, you'll be need to leave your urine sample with your doctor. And these are some of the trade names of drugs that have got tenofovir in them. So if tenofovir is one of the ingredients, just make sure that your kidneys are happy, ask your doctor or your nurse. Okay. Bones. Having HIV seems to be a risk factor for osteoporosis, which is a risk factor for breaking bones. Okay, so we need to be thinking about it, particularly as again, tenofovir can thin the bones just very slightly. In most people, not to a degree that would cause a risk of fractures, but in the, in the older group of people, important to check, um, and your doctor does a score to see if you're at risk of fractures, maybe do it does a DEXA scan to see how your bone density is looking, and particularly if you've had a fracture, you know, have a look to see if, if that's still the right medicine for you. Check your vitamin D, it's from sunshine and daylight, have enough calcium, and weight-bearing exercise is good for all these things really, blood pressure, bone density, all those things. Okay. Here's one that comes up quite a lot, memory and cognitive function. Again, circulating virus, having virus swimming around the blood is bad for us, um, and controlling your viral load is good for us. Um, so there's an effect, there's definitely effect of detectable HIV on the brain in terms of cognitive function, clear thinking, memory, um, maintaining that through older age. Whether there's an effect of 
well-controlled HIV is, is a little bit less clear, I think. Treatment protects your brain from damage. So report any memory problems, and certainly in our clinic we do a memory assessment and then we've got psychologists and we link in with memory clinic if there are problems. Okay. Other aspects of psychological and mental health affect memory and people who suffer with low mood or depression can struggle with memory as part of that. So it might be that we need depression treating and then memory improves, um, but obviously that all needs proper assessment. If Favarins is one of the older drugs that many people have had in the past, and if you've not got on with it, you will remember that it makes you dizzy, nightmares, feeling unsteady. Some people tolerate it absolutely fine. We don't tend to start with it so much anymore because there are more tolerable drugs, but if people are happy on it, they're still taking it. Just have, a, have, a, have to have a think about whether going forward it's still the right thing because there possibly is an effect on memory and cognitive function. So that's another thing to just review if those are the sort of symptoms you're having. It's in a tripler. Um, and the new generic version of a tripler. Okay. Does anybody have a bathroom cupboard looking like that? <laughs> um, handfuls of medication. So as the number of medical problems increases, obviously people start prescribing more and more medicines. And, you know, we prescribe some medicines, and then I see that people have another 18 medicines from their GP, and that's just not, a, not going to work, is it? So we have to try and rationalise. Can we reduce the number of tablets to make it a bit easier? Do we really need all those medicines from the GP, or can we do without some of them? Are some of them interacting with others? And have we had a, a chat with somebody who knows your health well about rationalising those medicines at any time? And you really can sometimes cut them down quite well. So make sure your HIV clinicians communicate with your GPs and vice versa. Ensure that your GP knows what's going on and educate them if need be. Make sure that you or your GP check for drug interactions. It can be complicated if there are a lot of medicines going on, but somebody needs to check. So your HIV clinician can do that. Your GP can do that if they're prescribing something new. Okay, so bring your meds. If you're starting something new, bring it, because people often get surprised that at the hospital we can't see what your GP's been doing necessarily. Okay. Slightly less medical, but really important, and as flagged by the Uncharted Territory Report, is this issue of loneliness and isolation, and how social circles can diminish slightly, and not everyone has extended families. So in this survey, 82% of people with HIV in the older age group ex um, experience some loneliness. Um, and a large number experiencing what we call self-stigma. So those things are very much around. It seems that things are improving, but too slowly for most people in terms of stigma and the ability to, to openly talk about HIV um, in, in a public space. So what does your HIV need, doctor need to know and do? Well, we've got standards of care, the most recently from 2018 from the British HIV Association. And there are some key things for example, people living with HIV should expect to have equitable access to consistently high quality care no matter where they live. So you should always be able to access your HIV care and not have to travel too far. Regular screening, so, that's, so checkups, to detect risk factors for just the sort of health problems that we've been talking about, cardiovascular disease, bone disease, kidneys and liver and other things. So we'll do a you know, check for diabetes, for example, once a year. Okay. We've touched on this, whether we stay on the same treatment or whether there's a change of treatment needed. And it really is very much an individual thing. So to review your medicine, look at whether things have changed in terms of new medicines from the GP, whether risk of, for example, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks has increased, to, and just to, to see if there's a sensible adjustment that can be made. It's not that everybody over 50 has to come off a particular drug, but it's about looking at the individual and seeing what suits. Some of the issues are, a back of ear, I've told you, it's in Triomec and Kyvexa and others, is associated with a slightly increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So we might switch that to something else or take it out um, as people get older and that risk increases anyway, particularly for men. Tenofovir, that's the one with the urine sample and the kidney problems, which also thins bones just slightly. So we have to review that. Is that still right for you? Are we exhibiting any, of the, any early signs of those problems? Favarins we've mentioned, that's the one that makes us feel funny. Um, we take it at night and it can affect memory and cognitive function. Dorinavir and Atazanavir I put there, they're protease inhibitors taken either with ritonavir or as those combined tablets, anyone on the giant tablet Resolster or Evo does giant tablets. 
So the giant tablets tend to have these in and they interact with lots of other drugs and they can increase cholesterol and other lipids. So we just need to be aware of that, that they're key culprits for interactions. And so that might not suit as other medications are coming into your handful of daily tablets. Okay. So do we need to be on new medicines? There are some new medicines. Some of them are really good interactions wise, a lot more tolerable. Um, lots of things coming sort of thick and fast, really new medicines to suit injectables coming up. So again, it's not that over 50 come off a particular drug. It's just about looking at that individual. Is there something easier on the kidneys, the newer tenofovir, for example, or taking tenofovir out altogether? Is there something easier on the heart? easier on the bowels can cause diarrhea and tummy upsets and the efavirenz on the brain. Many people rather than traditionally it's been three medicines in combination hasn't it three medicines with some of them becoming more powerful now two seems to be okay if you've got one of those really powerful ones in there so it might be that you don't always need to replace but we can actually cut down and what I've been able to do with a lot of older people is rationalise the drugs, use some of the newer ones to cut down the numbers of tablets or the interactions or the inconvenient side effects, which is great. So new things invented, perhaps since your regimen was last reviewed. Okay. So we do, don't we? We need to go to our GPs, don't we? Okay. So yes, you do need to see your GP. It's teamwork. And I know sometimes it feels disconnected. People say, well, I go to the rheumatologist for this and the, car the cardiologist for this. But the GP is the centre of your healthcare, receives correspondence from everyone and will spot a problem and be able to rationalise medicine. So that's the centre of your healthcare. Make sure they know what medicines you take. If the GP has your medicine on, on their list on the computer, then interactions will be flagged up to them. So it's good if they actually have your medicine recorded they don't prescribe it but to have it recorded okay and so what I've told you is probably not much new but hopefully is reassuring in that with some really basic common sense lifestyle adjustments and good communication with your doctor things can be really good so get the rec recommended monitoring know your numbers so just you know ask what should this be what should that be what should my blood pressure be Make sure your HIV care providers and your GP talk to each other. Drop any extra weight before it goes up even more. Don't smoke. Have a look at your alcohol unit, so make sure that your liver's healthy and it's not under extra strain. Do some weight-bearing exercise, and just walking is weight-bearing exercise, but at a distance, or maybe so that you're slightly breathless. Good for bones, good for weight, good for blood pressure. Um, and, have, and just look after your mental health or ask for help with mental health if these things become an issue. Okay. That's what I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Claire. Are there any questions for Dr. Claire while, we, while we're still thinking about it? It's more of a comment than a question. Um, I changed GP quite recently and had to introduce him to the Liverpool Interactions website. He then put my HIV medication onto the GP database. Great. Why isn't that done as a matter of course? If the HIV clinic writes the GP anyway, I think it's because they, they don't prescribe. Do they it? could, yes, and can they please? Um, but I think it's because they don't prescribe them, and maybe are unfamiliar with them. And because we've got the trade name and all the, you know, it might be a four-ingredient drug. Um, I think it's just getting that to be routine. But isn't that something that the the NHS system could incorporate, encourage? Our systems don't computer-wise talk to each other, which is why people-wise we have to talk to each mm. other. Um, so yes, you're right. And sometimes interactions are missed because it hasn't been done. So it is a good point to ask GPs to, to do that. I think they have to actively do it. Nothing will happen automatically. Any other questions? I'm just asking. Sorry. Wait for the microphone, <laughs> sorry. Cheers. I'm asking for a group of ladies. Um, their concerns were about the menopause, that some of the drugs may bring that on early and they were concerned that we're waiting for the marker of 50, but they're saying some of the markers of old age for them are coming sooner. How can that be managed and how can they have that conversation with either the specialist or with their GP? Just how, they, how can they manage yeah, thank the you. menopause? And also for some of the younger ladies as well, mm. 
they want to know, will it increase infertility? And mm -hmm. therefore, should that be a conversation they have when they're diagnosed? Mm -hmm. How does taking long-term medication affect your ability to have okay. children? Thank you for those. I've deliberately steered clear of some of the women's issues because we had a, a speaker about that. But it is known, you're right, that menopause can occur earlier in women with HIV than in women without HIV. And so it's about looking out for the symptoms and then thinking about what happens after that. Do, you know, that a discussion about hormone replacement therapy, a discussion about your medicines and about bone health and osteoporosis after that. Mm -hmm. So yes, it can occur earlier. In terms of fertility, I don't think there's evidence that just having HIV reduces fertility um, on its own. Um, so, but if that's a concern, then that's a conversation that should be had earlier on at diagnosis. You're right, I'm sorry, I did, I did um, leave some of the women's issues to uh, Sophie or Clive uh, on purpose about menopause. Mm -hmm. We were due to have a, a lady talk to us about female uh, issues around uh, growing older with HIV, so apologies for that. Um, but I could re recommend that you um, have a look at Sophia Forum, S-O-P-H-I-A. Um, they are producing, about to produce um, some materials around HIV and menopause. Um, you might also like to look up um, Shima Tarek, um, who is a consultant who did a study called PRIME, which is all around menopause. And I think still um, ongoing. The prime yes. studies had a lot of very um, good quality output. So there, there have been some reports yeah. and things around there. And um, you might finally also like to check out Positive UK, uh, who run some workshops around menopause and ladies. Um, and I'm not sure whether they come necessarily up here, but um, there'll be lots of information that they could provide you with as well. So there's, it, there's an increasing amount of stuff becoming available now, thankfully, because more women are getting involved in studies and more studies are looking at um, women's health with HIV. So um, those, those would be my recommendations to add to that as well. Um, the PRIME study, so Shima Tariq, S-H-E-M-A-T-A-R-I-Q, -T 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 -I, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I so. think also because when the doctors are talking to you about the... Sorry, when the doctors are talking to you when you get your diagnosis about medication, we're not always aware of the side effects. So if they are bringing the menopause on early and a woman hasn't had a child that's a conversation she needs to have, just as you're talking about with any of the medication. So for Caribbean groups, bone density, cholesterol, but you need to flag that up so it becomes habitual if you see somebody who may be in a high risk group and the medication, they need to be aware of why you're asking the questions, but also they need to be aware so that they flag it up in terms of the health of the woman. It may then impact the sort of meds she wants. Um, can take because then she has to think about okay then this may affect my ability to have children what do I want to do mm. with that then? So it's not so much affecting fertility it's more thinking if somebody's planning to conceive soon which ones have got proven safety in pregnancy yeah, yeah. yeah so planning ahead in terms of that absolutely yeah, yeah. thank you, thank you. Um, there was a slide which mentioned um, a statistic around 82% of people who um, have HIV who are older um, experiencing loneliness. I'm just wondering if you know how that uh, compares with the general population. That's a really good question. Clive is going to talk <laughs> a bit more on that because it's a Terence Higgins Trust report, actually. Um, I mean, it's it, considerably it, higher. Yeah. So uh, I think the, the figures are more like uh, in the 40s and 50s, the general population. Um, so, yeah, it was considerably yeah. higher, which is why we brought it up. I'm sure that these two things are yeah. linked. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. I think we'll have to leave it there so we can move on. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Um, you need this. It's me again now. So. <laughs> um, so, so um, I'm going to use the mic. Yeah, it's a lovely tip. So, um, 
so we, we, as I said, we were due to have Sophie Strachan here, but unfortunately she can't make it today. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit more. We had a, a nice sort of clinical feel from Dr. Claire. Um, I'm just going to talk about some more sort of psychosocial environmental factors that are influencing us as we grow older with HIV. Obviously, we don't live in a vacuum. We don't, we're not just a, a physical being or a psychological being, a social being, an environmental being as well. So, um, so just to highlight why we kind of talk about HIV and ageing, as I, uh, I alluded to at the start, um, the World Health Organization has predicted by 2030 that three quarters of people living in most countries, it's not all developed, uh, mostly developed countries, but not all countries, um, will be over the age of 50. Um, and many of them will have at least one age-related disease or condition. Um, and uh, approximately a third of those will have at least three as they grow older. So um, it's going to be a worldwide problem or issue that we're going to be talking about. So. Um, so I think it sort of raises the status, really, of why we're, why are we bothering talking about growing older. Um, in the UK, uh, the number of new diagnoses in people age over 50 continues to rise, and that is um, against the trend, which is generally down. I mean, we're not talking huge numbers, of course, but uh, every year, year on year, the proportion of those getting diagnosed over the age of 50 increases. Um, and unfortunately, late diagnosis is more significant in the over 50s and particularly the over 65. So a thing around um, messaging, um, how are we um, letting people know that they're at risk when they're in their 50s and 60s, 70s, 80s? Um, so uh, it's a bit of an issue there. And because obviously late diagnosis impacts the whole kind of trajectory of your um, life expectancy with uh, HIV, it increases your risk of mortality um, and uh, many people of course are getting diagnosed at A&E, I think the Public Health England said in 2017 about 20% of those diagnosed in their 50s were made at A&E. Now some A&E units are routinely um, screening for uh, HIV so that would pick up some of that. Um, but it does indicate that people's health has become, uh, has got to a sufficient stage where they're in critical condition that they need to be hospitalised. Um, and obviously that is not good. Um, so currently we've got about 40% of people living with HIV in the over 50s group. Um, and this is predicted to rise. Um, and I think the problem that we have in sort of talking about this is that we're obviously talking about people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, hopefully 90s um, and beyond. So we're talking about three, four, five decades of people um, who will all have different needs. They will come from different backgrounds, they'll have different experiences. Um, and so trying to fit them all into one size and one pot is not um, going to work anymore as the numbers increase. So in our survey, we found that um, people living with HIV over the age of 50 were more likely to have other conditions. And those diagnosed pre-96, so when medication became available, antiretroviral medication became available, um, were likely to have more conditions than their HIV, negative peer, uh, HIV positive peers who weren't diagnosed before medication became available. Um, and people are generally concerned how they're going to manage these um, conditions going forward. Um, we all know the health and social care system is not in great shape at the moment. Um, and if people are ageing... Uh, with other conditions, they may need more help from uh, social care organisations, particularly if they don't have any family of their own or partners or that sort of thing. So there is big concern around that. Um, and of course, we don't really know what the long term impact of living with HIV is. Um, people taking Truvada, for example, for 30 years, you know, what is that going to look like or other drugs that we have? Um, and um, mental health issues, of course, are quite high in people living with HIV and so the combination of um, living with pain and chronic pain and uh, other conditions plus mental health can be problematic for some people. Um, the health service is a little bit siloed I think we can all agree with that we tend to get treated per condition and so when we talk to people in with HIV they say well I'm 
I'm a person with X number of conditions and I would like my whole health to be treated holistically. Um, and that means that you have to really coordinate your care very well um, if you're going to live well with HIV um, and you have to communicate um, between multiple health providers and consultants and that sort of thing and some people don't feel they're able to do that or that that is something they feel confident in doing so that's a worry for people um, there is a concern that some GPs are not as knowledgeable as they might like around HIV I believe a doctor probably gets about seven hours um, on HIV within their seven years of training so not huge amounts of time spent for GPs in their training on HIV um, and there is a fear of discrimination within certain care settings um, and you know shocking statistics this morning on the news about um, sexual abuse of people in care settings um, so you know this is not just generally people living with HIV there's a there's a care crisis going on there's not enough people looking after people um, so this just f fuels some of the fears and worries that people have, of course. Um, there's also concern, obviously, about how people are going to pay for this. I and mean, this is a general concern of the general population as well. So, um, Will, if you've been living on benefits for most of your working life, um, how will you pay for social care? Or if you can't pay, what sort of social care will you get? And will there be a two-tier system? And that also was in the news, I guess, the other day about uh, concerns over the government's policies around social care. Um, and we know from a number of sources now, in, um, particularly the Positive Voices survey that came out um, last year, which is the biggest survey of um, people living with HIV in the UK, um, and they found that people of all ages actually living with HIV was twice as likely to have mental health problems as the general population or people of the similar age to them. So mental health is still a considerable problem for people. But we did find some good news in our survey in that as people grow older, they are more likely to rate their well-being as good or very good. And in particular over 65, so people who are technically retired, um, felt much more confident about their outlook. They reported that they um, were more confident with their finances. And there may be something around, you know, having a state pension coming in that's a reliable source of income. It's not going to be assessed. Um, and therefore, people don't have to worry about that. And people generally, um, as the quote says there, people feel more settled in themselves as they grow older. And there have been some studies outside of people living with HIV that kind of uh, concur with this um, with this information and these statistics. Employment discrimination still remains uh, the biggest issue, I think, probably for people living with HIV, um, and I think uh, particularly for those age fifty plus, um, there might have been a lifetime of st stigma and discrimination that has been endured. So. Um, particularly around sexual orientation, of course. Um, it was criminalised to be uh, gay um, up until 1967. So people now in the 50s and 60s will have grown up in that generation. Um, and it's only in sort of recent years that we've had sort of moving towards full equality, so in terms of being married, getting married and those sorts of things. So um, that preys on people's minds. There's a thing around ageism. Um, I think that's increasingly... Um, being seen in general society that people generally feel as they grow older they become more invisible and that their voice doesn't count anymore um, and we can add HIV onto that um, we could enter race we could talk about religion um, ethnicity we can talk about all sorts of different layers of stigma that compounds to make people ex people's experience um, of life that much harder. So, uh, in terms of employment, um, the people that we surveyed, um, there were less people who are economically active than the general population. Um, so, 45% of those who would be of working age were earning a living um, or getting income, part time income at least. And that compares with 72% of the general population. 
Um, and 36% of the respondents solely rely on wel welfare benefits. And of course, we have got this group of people um, who were diagnosed probably in the 80s and early 90s who are in their 50s and 60s now who were told to give up their work, cash in their pensions, go on holiday, live their life to the full for them because they were only given two years or so to live. And of course, a lot of these people are still living and that's great, but they're living on benefits and um, they were told that the disability living allowance would be protected. And of course, that changed in 2012 with the, the new Health and Social Care Act. And now what we find particularly is that this group of people are very stressed and very anxious about the whole process of being reassessed for benefits on regular um, at regular times. It used to be every two years, sometimes it's now every year. Um, and it just feels like a relentless cycle for people, I think, of having to justify why they need that money and becomes increasingly more difficult to get the medical evidence uh, and those sorts of letters that the DWP now requires. So this is a significant problem, I think, for a group of people. Um, and this, is, as I say, is mo more likely to be those diagnosed before 96 when treatment became available. Uh, and those who are living on benefits, we found, had the lowest um, levels of well-being the highest levels of self-stigma and were more likely to be lonely and isolated. So we found uh, an, an increase over 10 years. So we did a, stu a study the 10 years before this um, and found that um, now 58% of people that we spoke to um, were living in poverty uh, and that had decreased from 48%. But as I said before, those, on six, uh, those rate who were over 65 were more likely to say they had enough to live on uh, at a regular time. So um, that was interesting finding. I mean, of course, there are people who had carried on working and uh, receive a pension and are uh, you know, in, in reasonably good financial situation, but um, not everybody. So women have been ignored quite a lot in research over the years and um, they um, they often feel invisible unheard uh, we when we did the survey we did find that um, we had about 25 percent of the respondents were women which is sort of in line with um, the demographic of women living with HIV but we did find lowest lower levels of well-being people were more likely to be living on lower incomes than men. Um, very concerned about all aspects of growing older, often because they're having a caring role as well. So there's that whole thing about what happens to me and the person I'm caring for if I am not able to do that. So there's whole issues around family and caring responsibilities with women. And... Um, what the Sophia Forum research showed as well is that um, experience of, of stigma and fear of experience of uh, stigma were great barriers in accessing support. But when people found the support that they needed, um, they felt much more um, able to cope and much more um, able to move forward. Um, and there was a concern that there wasn't really enough information. And I think this is... Uh, alludes to your question actually about uh, menopause and, and, and women's um, information and health issues. So, um, and I know Sophia Film are gonna take that forward to try and, and, and improve that for, for women. Um, so just some final thoughts. We're gonna see increased numbers of people living with HIV age 50 and over, and that's a great thing. Um, but there will be possible complexities involved through living with other conditions and um, you know let's be honest this is something that the general public are also being are facing with we're, we're being told that you know there's an obesity epidemic there's um, you know all sorts of other conditions diabetes cardiovascular issues these are things that the general public also has to face so uh, if we take some of the advice that Claire gave us about keeping fit and trying to mod moderate what we eat and drink then hopefully we can um stave off some of these. Um, the primary health and social care sector really um, has to get involved with some of the issues that we're 
we raised in our report, um, particularly around the concerns around discrimination in social care settings, um, really not acceptable in the 21st century now that we're still having to endure that. Um, and I know that um, certainly uh, Michael Brady, who is the um, LGBT um, National Advisor for LGBT Health, um, uh, as part of Public Health England, has set up a whole task force addressing some of these issues around discrimination in the NHS um, and also within the social care settings. So hopefully we'll see some progress around that. Um, we try to get out into the social care settings and train people. And I know George House Trust are, are going to be looking at doing a bit more in that area as well going forward. Um, so many people are living on limited means and have no provision for the future. So that is a concern. Um, stigma and discrimination are still very problematic, um, leading to loneliness and mental health problems. Um, and we have to ensure that I think amongst all the good news stories we're, we're seeing around um, U equals U and can't pass it on and, and getting down to zero, all those initiatives that we don't forget there are still a lot of people, uh, you know, 100,000 odd people in the UK still living with HIV and those voices still need to be heard. They're, um, they're not invisible, these people, they still have some concerns. So we need to make sure that the messaging around HIV is a positive one, but it also recognises that it's not everyone who is able to live well at this point in time with HIV. So I'll leave it there um, and I'll take any questions if there are any. Um, so I, I agree with a lot of the things you said, but I'm a woman. The medication has affected my mobility. I'm a mother and a carer. I've had to give up my job so I'm living on zero money I rely on my partner I wanted to know if I could cash in a pension or be able to access my pensions earlier if you have an HIV status so that I'm not waiting for 67 I've been told I've got to wait before I can get it so financially we're struggling does the diagnosis not have a medical component that allows the DWP to then support us help us i'm not sure the answer to that um claire did you know if this anything any issues anywhere i mean i think it would be i don't know is the answer i think no but i would i would have to take advice on that i think it would be more to do with what your health is than whether you've got hiv or not because as we've just discussed life expectancy is is the same as people without HIV. So it's more about what your individual health is, maybe. But honestly, I wouldn't, I, I would have to take advice on that. Um, George House Trust may be able to help because they yeah. offer legal What are the forms called that you have to sign if it's like diagnosed with stage four cancer and you sign the S, well, I don't know. Something says they've got six months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That they'll be dead within. Yeah, six, six months. Yeah, yeah that. Yes. Thank you. That doesn't entitle you, even if you've got one of those, that doesn't entitle you to your pension. It doesn't. So, yeah. go on. Uh, I, I don't want to cause yeah. a, a problem. Lisa, yes, fine. Uh, well, all I can say is that I did. And, yes, because, yes, this is, now this is going back a bit. Uh, you'll, you'll find out in, 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 in a moment. But uh, I, di I didn't know this. I was totally uh, unaware. I mean, I, I was in the situation where, uh, just as, 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 as Claire has said, where I was told, you've got six months to live. Well, I, you get you have longer than that. I better put all my affairs in order. And, uh, and, uh, and my friend said, Maurice, just spend, spend, spend. Uh, this, this was, yeah, I was 50 odd at the time. So I was before, yes, I was before pension age. Yes, definitely. I was over 50, but I was, bef I was, I was below uh, pension age. And, uh, uh, and so I did, but of course, uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't, didn't die. I, I, I maxed three credit cards. And, and so, but I had good advice from Ivan Massa. I don't know if you know, know of Ivan Massa. And he said, look, Morris, you've got a DS-1500. 
DS-1500. It just didn't come back to me. DS-1500, uh, which means you've got a terminal illness. And at that time it was, because I had an AIDS diagnosis, six months to live. And so he said, you're, you're entitled to, to your, your teacher's, teacher's pension. So, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I got this massive uh, lump sum. And I thought, oh, would they give me it all in one go? Because I'm going to die. No. It's not, no, no, it's not. It's the terminal diagnosis. It's the DS fifteen hundred. That's a terminal diagnosis. Physically, sorry, it's because we're talking about HIV and aging. So, I am not at pension age, but I'm over fifty. Um, I can't do the things that I used to do before. I've attempted three jobs in which my ability, my memory, cognitive function is out the window it's just no good so I can't do how do I get an assessment for a whole new lifestyle because that doesn't come into it I'm just going in and out of jobs making a hash of it then having to come out and what's happened is I've backed down to looking after my mum because that's the only thing that flexes with my getting up and being really tired sometimes having energy sometimes and not others and that's why I'm saying it's really difficult to hold down a full-time job because I can't guarantee what state I'm going to come in. The meds are great. So in that sense, I can tweak them to a degree, but I'm not fully able to manage 35 hours a day, taking work home sometimes, just to keep up as an over 50 with some of the young ones who were doing that, and then retail work and things where it's really high pressure. I can't do and so looking after me mum has become what I do, but there's no money in it. And the lifestyle I had before that requires that I pay a serious amount of bills and I'm not getting the support. The, 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 we're, we were told as a couple we were earning too much, but it doesn't pay the bills. And I'm trying to think of ways that I can be productive, go in there, but have employers who are supportive. And at the moment, that part of the equation ain't even coming into it. Yeah, it's empty. Yeah, it, if that makes sense. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. I think we need to move on, and we've got Morris to we've got Morris to uh, to finish off for us. So um, to welcome Morris. There we go. Thank you. Um, how am I for sound? I'm fine for sound. Well, oh, that's me. Yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Clive, for, for inviting me to, to, to speak today. It is really is a privilege, and I do really mean that. It is a privilege not only to be here in, in this space, but to be here in life. Uh, next year, I won't be as old as your eldest patient, but I'm getting there. Next year, I will turn 80. So, and, so I'm, I'm living... Uh, I'm, I think I qualify to be an older person. According to the Bible, you lived... Uh, a, a long life is uh, three score years and ten. Well, I'm a dec decade. Uh, I'm getting almost a decade af after that. So that's 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 great. Um, and also, I'm a person living long term with HIV. I was diagnosed in 1984. But look, let, let's go through the slides and uh, and and we'll see, because there's so much that has, 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 has been mentioned today that I relate to, and is part of my story. And, uh, and I, I'm very fortunate. I am happy with the way I am at the moment. I am um, an older man living with HIV, a gay man, an older gay man living with HIV, and I am happy to talk about it, and I am happy with my life, and I'm very, very fortunate. I know that this is not the case for so many people. My heart goes out to people who are in a different situation than me, but I can only talk about my life. Okay, so here we go. Uh, to prove that I... Oh, that's the wrong way. It's that way, isn't it? Okay. Um, uh, no, I, uh, this, I was going to say this. I was born in 19, 1941. This is taken a little bit after that. As you, as you can tell, I'm a little bit, I was a bit smaller when I was born. And uh, I was born to... That's, that's my mum and dad and me. And my dad was in the army. Because he would be, wouldn't he? 1941. I'm a war baby. I'm not a not a, 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 a um, what's it? A baby I'm not a baby boomer. I'm, I'm older than a baby boomer. I'm a war baby, and that's that's my mum. 
and uh, this is me at school. And uh, as you can see, I took to, to dancing. I not only took to dancing, I took to drama. I appeared on stage in front of an adult audience at the age of seven, and I realised that was got, this has got to be part of my life. And music, too, has also been very much a part of my life. This is taken a little later. There's the whole family. Mum in the middle. That's the family on the left. And this is relatives and friends on the right. And as I said, music is part of my, my being. And, uh, and I am still employed. I, 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 I have a part-time job. I'm a church organist. And I get paid for it. And it helps. It really does help. And as, as I mentioned earlier, I was able to, to, to tap into my teacher's pension early. So I've got a teacher's pension, I've got a state pension, and I've got money coming in from... So, yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate. Let's, let's leave it at that. And that's a picture of me in my teens before I went to college. I won't go into the details of that because we haven't got time. But <laughs> <coughs> there I am at college. This is the College of the Venerable Bede in Durham. I was doing a teacher's certificate because I, I really wanted to go to Oxford, but uh, circumstances didn't allow. So here I am at the College of Venerable Bede, and what did I do? Of course, I was involved with drama right from the, from the start. And the next year was uh, Sleep of Prisoners by Christopher Ishwood in the, the College Chapel. Brilliant. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I also found that I was good at, I'd never been interested in sport, but in the third year at school, PE teacher came to me and said, Morris, I think you'd be good at long distance running. Now, no PE teacher has ever come up to me and said anything nice ever in my life. And to say that, I thought, well, well I'll give it a try. And he was right. He was right. And by the time I got to college, I, I, it, I improved enormously. So I was doing long distance running, and that is the modern pentathlon team. I was good enough to be, to be chosen to be part of the, not the college uh, pentathlon team, but Durham University pentath modern pentathlon team. Mind you though, modern, modern pentathlon has running, swimming, fencing, shooting, and riding. Uh, unfortunately, the, the college didn't have any horses, so we didn't do the riding bit. But it was, it was good. It was fabulous. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I thought that was the best years of my life. But, I've, but you find out that that, that that isn't the case. Things can, you can find pleasure, you can find enjoyment at any stage of your life. And this, this, is, this is why I said I'm so happy to be here today. Now, this is me teaching. Um, not my first job, but at Macclesfield. And I s set off, uh, uh, started off a, a wind band, and there we are with the boys performing. And of course, as well as the band, choir. So I've got lots of, of youngsters involved, and it's really, really wonderful when former pupils write and say, what a difference I made to their lives. So, although I've never really wanted to be a teacher, I wanted to do other things, uh, I made a difference. And, and there's, that's, there's something really good about that. Next, uh, jump again. Uh, midlife crisis, change of career, and I actually got to do what I always wanted to do, which was to work in professional theatre, the Victoria Theatre in Stoke-on-Trent. And uh, you notice right underneath that was the HIV diagnosis, because I'd only been uh, at the theatre for a year when I became infected with HIV. At that time, 1984, it, it, it wasn't called HIV, was it? It didn't have a name, it wasn't until 19, 1986 it was called HIV. But there I am, running my second marathon to raise funds for the, uh, the New Vic Theatre, and I was HIV positive at the time, and didn't know it. But I went to America with my partner at the time, there I am in front of a, whatever kind of car that is, American car that is, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and Atlanta, Georgia. Whilst we were there, we picked up an STD, and we had shots, penicillin shots, at the clinic in, in Georgia, and in uh, Atlanta. And then the, the, the STD didn't completely clear up for my partner, so when we came back, 
we went to the clinic in, uh, in um, Hearts Hill and we were tested for this new mysterious disease. His results came back negative and mine was positive. I always thought for quite a long time that, I, that somehow or other HIV had mysteriously piggybacked on the, the back of the, the uh, STD and that's where I caught it from. Rubbish. You cannot, can, uh, you cannot uh, contact HIV from someone who doesn't have it. You cannot contact HIV with someone who is positive and has an undetectable viral load. But, I didn't know that at the time, but I did realise later that where it happened was three months earlier when I was in Amsterdam. So that's why I now, now know that when I ran that marathon, I was HIV positive. But I've, I, I thought it was the end of the world, but, but, it, it, but it wasn't. And life continued, and I was, that's me on the piano at the New Vic Theatre, raising funds for the new theatre, the new theatre in the round. And I had a, a successful whole decade, a successful career in professional theatre, which is a story in itself, and I had a fabulous time. But 1994, I developed AIDS, was given uh, eight, yes, <laughs> and six months to live. And so I was, but uh, this is 1995, I hadn't died. So I wanted to give back to Staffordshire Buddies who'd helped me through by providing me with a buddy who was extremely good because he did not, not only what buddies were supposed to do, which was to help you live as, as full a life as possible with HIV, but in fact what they were doing were helping you to die with dignity. And he helped with the funeral arrangements and he even took on the power of eternity, which wouldn't happen now, but he did. And I just made the one stipulation that nobody would sell my house until I was dead. I'm so pleased I, I made that decision. <laughs> uh, here I am on the organ of the, the uh, uh, Victoria Hall in Hanley, a fabulous instrument for, for manual. So I, I really sort of decided to uh, devote time to improving, upping my game on, on the organ, uh, if, if that, which is why, of course, I, I'm now I'm a, a freelance organist and, uh, and I, I can, you know, I, I get bookings. And uh, I had a funeral this week and a, a funeral last week and I've got weddings and I've got, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's good to be busy, it's good to be wanted. And that means volunteering and helping with other people. And what I have come to the conclusion of is that HIV, now that it's under control, I, it's other things which are more important. That's why I got involved with Age UK. Well, it was, it was, at that time, it was two separate. It was Age Concern and Help the Aged. But th it was just before they'd... Uh, and we're still fighting on that, th th that count. Social care... Um, for, for the elderly is still a major issue. Yes. Oh, there's a lot to cover and to, to get to this slide. A lot, lot happened in my life. We're talking about, uh, Clive talked about loneliness and, and uh, mental health issues and, and, de and depression. And uh, because I'd, I was doing all these things for um, Staffordshire Berlin and uh, these concerts for, for World Days, it just got bigger and bigger. And so in 1999, I did a concert in a Stoke Minster and Litchfield Cathedral with hundreds of people, young people and, and uh, 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 older people and uh, adults. And I was doing everything and I just got burned out. And my HIV consultant diagnosed me, diagnosed me with Clinical depression. Now, getting out of clinical depression is not an overnight job. It takes, well, it took years. But the thing that saved me was uh, um, Mind Locally with one to one uh, consultation uh, and Mind in London, who said, Morris, you really ought to go for a um, Real Lives, Real Life, Real Lives, Real People award to do a, a, a project of community benefit and personal development, which I did. And it made a huge difference. But the only people that were able to give me the courses to, to do this, this uh, uh, project was the Open University. 
and I thought, this is doing me so good, much good, I must enrol as an undergraduate afterwards. And I did. And in 19, uh, 19, uh, 2006, I, I, I graduated with a BA honours in humanities, uh, with my special subjects being music and Spanish. And I realised that the linguistics part of the Spanish was doing my brain so much good, I was thinking more clearly, I was more confident, that I thought, well, hmm, well I'm not going to do a master's, I'm going to do another degree in linguistics. Now, you can't use the Spanish, so you've got to do two other languages. So I did French and German. And believe me, German is a very difficult language. It was for me. Some other people find it easier than French. But uh, they said, well, look, my German teacher said, look, Morris, with German, you learn all the rules and that's it. With French, you learn all the rules, and then you spend the rest of your life learning the exceptions. And I thought, hmm, yeah, sounds like English. Uh, so there we are. And then... 2020, uh, 2004, sorry, 2004, I've been living with HIV for 20 years. I thought, I've got to celebrate this. That was the year the Lord of the Rings uh, uh, came out, and, and uh, a friend of me gave me the, 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 the second DVD with the locations, and I thought, must go to New Zealand. Just happened that an old boyfriend lived there in Auckland. I thought, oh, and it all worked out swimmingly. And I went to, to New Zealand for the next five years and thoroughly enjoyed it. Fell in love with the country. Uh, that's me on the top of, uh, of the Fox Glacier. So, yeah, you know, you can do so, you just push yourself, you know, you, you take risks. Ah, that's great. Now then, 2009, this one. And that year, I not only went to New Zealand, I thought, that's a jubilee, 25 years living with HIV. You must celebrate this. Okay. So I thought I will give something back. I will go to South Africa and, uh, and I will volunteer with an organisation, a Christian organisation, who are helping AIDS orphans and vulnerable children and giving home-based care to people living with HIV. And it went swimmingly until it gave my presentation. Cause I'm, and I'm open. I said, I'm a, a person, a gay man living with HIV. Oh! And they had problems with that. They had enormous... I said, what was the issue? I said, we've never had an openly gay person volunteer with us before. So I said, well, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to go back home? Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we'll pray. <laughs> fine, I said, you pray, I'll stay. And I, and I, got, I got on fine with, with all the kids and, and everybody. It was, it was terrific. I, th I thoroughly enjoyed it. Anyway, I thought it's time to look at Big Sister in 2011. So it started by visits to Australia and I've, I've loved Australia and I've visited all the provinces apart from Cabin, apart, all the uh, uh, states apart from Canberra. Uh, I, in fact last year I was at Kangaroo Island and it really distressed me to find that the forest fires had even got to Kangaroo Island and the koalas had to be shipped out to, uh, to save them. And that's, that's yeah. well, I just get on with, I get on with, with, uh, with, with I mean, animals and small children. I, I don't know. I, I, that's me looking after an orphan kangaroo. <laughs> A joey. And that's me later, another, another visit with, uh, anybody know what that is? No? It's a wombat. It's a wombat. A wombat! <laughs> it's another marsupial. Uh, and th they're fabulous creatures. She's called Boo. And uh, she didn't want a photograph taken, but she did want to nibble the hairs on my legs. And so, uh, terrific, terrific, terrific. Uh, oh, that's <laughs> that was the year. I came back from, uh, from, from, from my holidays and I, and I got this request that Morris, uh, do you want to go to Morocco? I said, I, no, sh shouldn't other people be go to Morocco? Do you want to go to Morocco with the, with the, with the British Council as, a, as an elected citizen? Yes, I said, I do. So that's me in, in Morocco. <laughs> and, oh, I thought I'd take that one out. But that's me uh, playing the organ in, uh, uh, in Melbourne. And that's me in Singapore. And... That's me last year in Kangaroo Island, and that's me this year. Of course, last month, this time, I was in Havana, in Cuba. And that's the, uh, the um, Museo de la Revolución, 
which used to be the presidential palace. And as you can see, it's, a, it's the Hall of Mirrors. It's fabulous. I think I'm going to run out of <laughs> So it's uh, our activism, yes, speaking out, challenging HIV stigma. These are things that I do. Uh, this me reading from uh, a book I contributed to. It's not my book. It's, uh, 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 I can't remember his name now. Uh, Roland Chester's, Roland Chester's Ripples. Yeah, there's, there's a, a cake in the, in the form of the book. So there we are. And that's me last, no, it was, yes, last year, 2019, 2019, you equals you. And we'll finish there. That's the parade with George House Trust, and that brings us back home. Thank you very much indeed. That's very great. I hope you enjoyed that. It's got a nice contrast to all the kind of medical and other stuff. So does anybody have actually questions they want to ask from Morris or any comments they might like to say before we close today's event? Silence. Oh, that's... Uh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Spoke too soon. First of all, how much I enjoyed that. It was uh, that Good, truly thank inspiring. You. Thank you. Um, you th did you find that loving, having an active life before you were diagnosed has helped you later on in life? And secondly... You, since you've become um, diagnosed, were you more of a risk taker now than you were before? More of a risk taker now than you are before? All oh, right. Uh, good question. I, I, th I, think, th I think the fact that, that I was um, healthy uh, and active before I b became HIV positive had, had an effect. Because I haven't mentioned this, but uh, I, d uh, I, I didn't have... I, I was off treatment. I, di I did not accept treatment. The f I mean, the first thing that came on available was AZT, and I refused it because I was healthy. I was and I was doing the job I loved, you know, working in the theatre. And so I said, no, no way. And then, of course, they said, oh, they discovered by halving the dosage, it's twice as effective. Still, I said no. It was only in 1994 when I realised that the HIV was gotten into my brain. And I thought, well, I, yes, I need to go on AZT because AZT does cross the blood-brain barrier. So I was on AZT monotherapy for a very short period of time. So uh, there's that. And no, the, the, the courage, the, uh, the, the risk-taking, uh, I think that came about when I dis when You know, when, that, that, that shot of me on, on the Fox Mountain, uh, the Fox Glacier. Before going up to that, there was this, a form that you had to fill in. It said, do we, is, is there any uh, uh, health conditions that we should know about? And I thought, no. And that was it. Because that was, that was uh, avoiding self-stigmatization. You know, I could say, I've got HIV. Well, that's... That, that, well, now I know that that, 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 that really wasn't a, a, an issue at all. But it, it, it could have been an issue for, issue for them. So, yes, I have become more <coughs> afterwards. Yes, okay. Next project. Pardon? Next project. The next project. Uh, well, I, I get, see, I, there's more slides. And I am... The, I, I, the <laughs> <laughs> so, so we didn't get onto that. I'm uh, um, involved with uh, 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 an LGBT older people's group which I, I helped to found in uh, 10 years ago now, so it's our 10th year. Uh, we had funding, which has run out. So my next project is trying to get three years funding to continue that. And it would be really nice to, f to have, an, uh, I've got a, a diploma for, for, for the piano, but I don't have one for the organ. And I would really like to have that. And I do want to go back to Cuba. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, you know, it, it's a challenge. You know, it's not easy. Uh, but I, no, the people there are absolutely fabulous. Loved it, loved it. Yeah, so that's three mm -hmm. things, okay? Brilliant. Thank Bye. you, Morris. Just goes to show, isn't it? You, uh, there's always something that you can uh, push yourself to do. Uh, you have the mindset to do it. So I'd really like to thank Morris for his okay. uh, sharing his story with us. I'd also like to... Sh uh, um, Thank Dr. Clare for coming in and giving us a, a very positive view, I think, on uh, the clinical side of ageing with HIV. Thank you all for coming. Uh, there's a lot of food <laughs> here. Um, <laughs> we had some mistakes with the ordering system, so we ordered twice. So um, 
if people want to take doggy bags and that sort of thing home with them, then please do uh, hate to see food go to waste. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to everyone online. And I wish you a safe onward journey from wherever you're going to. Thank you very much. <laughs>